Welcome to the Miami Real Estate Show. Today, I have for you a great, great interview. I have Alicia Cervera Sr. and Alicia Cervera Jr. They share with us their insights, their knowledge on how they have been able to sell over $12 billion in real estate, over 45,000 condominiums just in South Florida. They share with us their success, their failures, how they came out of those failures. They share with us also what they learned from partnering with the biggest real estate developer in South Florida or in Florida, George Perez, what Alicia learned from that experience. She also shares how Miami has become a world city, about the education in Miami. She talks about a great quote. She says, there are no opportunities without challenges. And every challenge brings an opportunity. She also talks about specifically the Miami real estate market. She says in the interview, and I want you to see this, the way she says it is beautiful. Because Orlando, many people talk about Miami and the weather and the location. How special Miami is because of the weather and the location. And she says to me, but other cities can also argue that they have the location and the weather. And then she pauses and says, but it's the people that make Miami different. We have two wonderful business women with so much experience to share with us. And I hope you enjoy this interview and learn from this interview as much as I, as I did. So I leave it for you so you can enjoy for an hour from these two tycoons of the real estate market in Miami. Take care and have a very productive day. Enjoy the interview. This segment of the program is brought to you by Ion East Edgewater, the 36-story luxury condominium located in the heart of East Edgewater, Miami's hottest new neighborhood within minutes of the Arts and Design District in downtown. The Ion concept is all about high design at an exceptional price. The building features a 75-feet lap pool with dive-in movie theater, an indoor-outdoor fitness center, and a 37th-floor sky deck featuring an infinity pool and resident sky lounge, surrounded by views of the dynamic Miami skyline and the bay. For more information, visit http colon slash slash ionmiamicondos.com or call 866-367-3778. 866-367-3778. Welcome to another edition of Top Producer Miami. It is my pleasure uh, to have today both Alicia Cervera Sr. and Alicia Cervera Jr. Uh, I was talking to them before the interview that I want to deviate from the general questions uh, that we usually ask top producers and industry movers and shakers. Because what we have here are the, uh, you know, there are so much history, so many stories, so many interesting things for everybody involved, even if it is not in real estate, but in Miami about uh, the people you've met, what, what you helped build in Miami. So first of all, I want to get started on when, when Alicia Sr. came to Miami, what year? What year? 1961. 1961. I came with, from Peru and I came with my Cuban husband. Okay. <laughs> I had fled Cuba through the Mexican embassy. Okay. And, uh, and we went to Mexico, from Mexico we came to Miami. Why Miami? Because of the Cubans at the time? Yes, my, my, my two daughters okay. were in Miami with the grandparents. Okay. And my two brothers-in-law were in uh -huh. Bay of Pigs in Mission. Okay. So uh -huh. they were, they were uh -huh. in Castro, yeah, okay. with the problem when they were caught. Okay. <laughs> so, but, uh, and Alicia, what's your background? I was born in Cuba. Okay. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, so, wow. Um, okay. and, and actually, my sister and I arrived in Miami okay. just a few months before my parents followed. Okay. So uh, we came here with our, our nanny that we adored that was waiting for us. <laughs> okay. And my grandparents that were already here, my uh, paternal grandparents. Okay. So I say that I had the privilege of really growing up in three cultures because both of my parents are very strong individuals. So mm -hmm. dad with the Cuban culture. Right. My mother who's consummate Peruvian. Okay. And of course growing up in Miami in the United States. And my grandparents on my father's side were Spaniards. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was born in Cuba, but my grandfather actually returned to okay. his home in Spain that he had never sold. Okay. And my Peruvian grandparents were in Peru. So we would summer 
between the two. And uh, I think it was uh, such a beautiful thing that I was raised in so many cultures because certainly as our city has evolved, Definitely. we've pulled from all of them. And why real estate? My mother was involved in real estate as a, some thing of a pleasure type of thing because she enjoyed, she was a frustrated architect, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she okay. had been in Miami huh? 20, 20 houses in okay. Miami. And when I arrived here, I tried to get a job and I have mentioned it already many times <laughs> in Sears Roebuck. Okay. Because I yes, need definitely. to work. And we were the, I, I, my, you know, we wrote, I wrote the, the title of a book, it was called 45 Minutes to Poverty, which is 45 Minutes to Poverty. To, to want, poverty. Yeah, yeah. Because from, from Havana to Miami, there were 45 minutes. <laughs> and you leave everything and you're right here without a cent. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the story of yes. most Cubans, right? Yes, yes. But yeah. I only wrote the, the front page. <laughs> okay. There, there were more than that. So I arrived there. <laughs> now, I, I didn't want to mention it at the beginning because it's just Cervera is just, it's a name that is associated with real estate. But for some people that might not be from Miami and they're watching or listening to this interview, you, I mean, you help you help sell or develop, you know, Four Seasons, uh, Ritz, Ritz Carlton in Miami, the Satai, Viceroy, Brickell Avenue, which is our, you know, it's uh, such a landmark in, in Miami, uh, the Palace, Atlantis, Villa Regina, uh, Imperial, Brickell East, uh, so many buildings. But I know when you came to Miami, uh, the zoning at the time was different, right? There, I think there was one building in the area, so. Yes, it was one high rise and everything else in Brickell Avenue from 15 Road to 26, the entrance to Kibbeth Kane mm -hmm. was zoned for uh, one residence only. Okay. There were very big lots and those was residence now in one of those residences, the palace and another one is Villa Regina. Right. <laughs> and they used to belong to, to people, I mean, some of them from New York. Okay. They have their summer houses here. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were ab abandoned because uh, after a while, I don't know the story exactly, but they were not here anymore. Okay. So the houses were in, well, some of them were, as I told you, about okay. them. So when this new law was passed, that right. we can go multifamily okay. and multi-residential, I thought that was a great opportunity, because it was such a beautiful avenue, and so many people were starting to look at Miami as, as a place to be, right. especially in that moment, South Americans. Mm -hmm. Back in the 60s, yes, 60s, yes. In, this, in the early 67, I think mm -hmm. the law was passed. Okay. And uh, so many developers, especially the, one of the first ones to come was uh, Harry Hensley from New York. Right, you mentioned he Harry says, Hensley, yes. He saw the opportunity in this uh, new Miami and New York Avenue, and they bought a beautiful lot. It was... Uh, no the school there. Okay. That uh, just by coincidence, my my older daughter Veronica had made her first Holy Communion in the church. Oh really? What a coincidence! <laughs> okay. Okay. And they bought that lot, and uh, and they start uh, one of the of the most beautiful buildings. Which is the name? Uh, it's the, the, the palace. palace. Yes, exactly. Very yeah. uh, mm -hmm. nice building. And, uh, and Alicia, and you, wh when do you came into the industry? When? Because you, you went to school here in Miami, I assume. I did. Okay. Um, I suppose that I came into the industry when I started chasing mom. Okay. <laughs> As she was pacing lots. Okay. And um, and I was, quote, on a picnic. Okay. And I was running behind her, and she was going one, two, you know, measuring okay. the distance. Uh -huh. And she tossed me a hard-boiled egg. Okay. I was probably, I don't know, three, four, five years uh, old then. So you have real estate in your blood. I think uh -huh. so. Okay. You know, when, when moms sit around the table with their daughters and talk mm -hmm. about whatever they talk about, we talk about real estate. So it was, you know, find the real estate sign or who can pick out the tallest building. <laughs> okay, so it's all about real estate in the family. Well, it's yes. all about real estate. Okay. But, um, but I got my license when okay. I was 21. Oh, that was, okay. I was at the University of Miami mm -hmm. and I was studying psychology and okay. my dad sat me down and he said, you know, that's really nice, honey, that you're in school and mm -hmm. it's important that you get your degree and psychology is great, but um, I really don't want you to starve to death and you need to get a real estate <laughs> license. <laughs> oh, 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 that's a very good advice. Okay. <laughs> you know, and okay. my, my dad doesn't have a lot of rules, but the rules he has okay. is pretty clear on and I learned many years prior to that not to fight with him. Okay. So I just said, no problem, dad. And okay. God my real estate license mostly to get him off my okay. back. Was it easy at the time to get a real estate license like, like it is right now? Because I, I understand that back in the 60s, it was difficult to get a real estate license, right? Or it was difficult in this situation. 
No, the, the exams were not difficult. Okay. The thing is that you have to be an American citizen right. at that time, not a resident. Okay. Or you have to have right. a citizenship to be able to sell property in the United States. Okay. Oh, imagine. So you t you took the license. I took the license, right. and um, and of course I was in school, and then I went to graduate school. Mm -hmm. But what I would do is work. And you summers. major in in psychology, and and, and I was in the PhD program in clinical psych. Okay. And mm -hmm. so um, I would work uh, for mom in, in the summers, okay. uh, part time. E actually, every time I'd get a job okay. that wasn't with her, she'd go nuts. Okay. And it's like I can't <laughs> believe you're doing this. I'm so busy. I okay. need your help. Do you know how hard it is to find talent? Okay. And um, I never really fully understand and understood and appreciated it until my daughter graduated from college oh really and she started talking to me about going yeah. here and going there and you know we've been so lucky to okay. always have so much work and I'm thinking to myself are you kidding me don't you can't you see how much we need you okay. <laughs> I'm ready with, and then all of a sudden I'm going you know I think I'm sounding like my mom okay. <laughs> okay. so um, it, it goes full circle but you know ultimately people have to decide right. what they want to do with their right. lives but uh, this is a beautiful business and it's a business with tremendous opportunities mm -hmm. and I've been lucky to grow up in a city that grew up with me so the opportunities have always kind of been the right size. Right. So ultimately, we um, folded into the business, and here we are. So how many generations are working with the company now? It's the third generation. The third generation, the third generation. The third right? Third generation. Working with the company. Now, you've worked with many uh, uh, developments in the city of um, with the many developers, and uh, and I know you had many many stories. Uh, any and you've been to many different also uh, up and downs in the economy. Mm. Um, anything that you, you learned from maybe the 1990s, then in the 2000s, and then right now, anything, Alicia, I know you're very involved and... Uh... Well, I think um, different lessons were learned at different times, and if, if you talk... The downturn from, from the difficult times, what, what, what have you learned from the difficult times? Um, well, when we were in the anticipating mm -hmm. um, the last downturn, I remember, that's year. Um, that's I'm going to say 2007, okay. 2008. Mm -hmm. Right. I remember Mom looked at me and she said, "If the banks don't fail us, we'll mm -hmm. be fine." Okay. And um, so we were plodding along, and uh, all of a sudden, I was getting ready to close about 350 units at a building called 50 Biscayne, right. and I had right. like 50 yeah. closings scheduled. And that morning. Uh, the FDIC pulled all of the loans with Freddie and Fannie. They were all canceled. So I remember sitting there wow. thinking to myself, I guess the banks just failed us. <laughs> wow. Like at least 50. And it, it just coincidentally happened on the day that I was scheduled to start my closings in that building. And it was clearly the beginning of, of, of the debacle. And see, we need point. to see that, put it in perspective, is some people, some real estate agents get stressed because uh, a closing gets delayed, right? Uh, we have an issue with a closing, right? Now we're talking 50 in one day. Right? 50 in one day, okay. at least. And what we really were talking is a, a redefinition of okay. the entire industry because when they, what they did is they stopped. They just put red flag stop. And so for a while there, you were thinking, well, the red flag will come down. Right. Well, it just kept going higher and higher. And um, so then we spent the next couple of years really um, reinventing ourselves. Mm -hmm. I remember when mom faced that, mm -hmm. that critical time in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Right, because it's different, different yeah, uh, up and downs in, in the economy. Right, right? And, and we thought, well, it, it's a perfect storm for, for uh, if you remember that movie where the mm -hmm. ships, ships yeah, sank, definitely, right? Yeah, definitely, of course. Yeah. So, um, George Clooney. Yes. OPEC, <laughs> right, so OPEC formed, right. um, and which destabilized the dollar, right. which destabilized all of the, of the currencies in South America, which sent interest rates for the first time in the history of the United States to 21%. Right. So the banks failed. Because right. all of a sudden, you know, something that had been stabilized under 10 forever. And the solution came in all kinds of creative things. Among them was coming up with adjustable rate mortgages. Right. So I remember in this next cycle, I kept looking at the bankers and saying, listen, you guys, you have to come up with something. With a product, And yes. they kept looking at me and saying, well, we don't do end loans, Alicia. We do construction loans. We do this. And I said, well, let me tell you something, guys. I don't talk to bankers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm doing I it. talk to buyers. It is a different <laughs> world. Right. And collectively, I remember um, being at Icon Brickle and okay. looking at the lenders and saying, listen, if you do not provide end loans to the buyers, mm. you have the loan. Right. You have to show that you believe in this product right. and you have to transform your construction loan into end user money. 
at which point they told me I was out of my mind. But ultimately, a year or a year and a half later, that's exactly what they did. They stepped up and they started giving end loans to those buyers. And then the closing started happening. Now, uh, what did you exactly learn or something that did you learn from that experience, that very stressful situation, a very stressful moment in your, in your life, in your business, in your career? And how, how, how you learn to overcome that situation that makes you a better business person today? One of the things that I think is very important is to remain calm. Mm -hmm. Because when you're calm, you pass that, that spirit of peace to your buyers. And then the and buyers to your team, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, to your team and to your right. buyers also. I, I don't remember in the, in the crisis before this one and the other one, I called my buyers. I, had, I was selling in Guadalajara a project called Tiffany. What year was it? In 1982. 1982. 1982 okay. And I was selling this, uh, this apartment. Mm -hmm. And all, a lot of these buyers were uh, from Mexico. And uh, others were from Canada or from New York. And I remember calling all of them and saying, if you close now in three years, your value is going to be recovered mm -hmm. because it's a thing of that the a failure of, of, the, of the banks, not as a failure of the economy. Mm -hmm. So many of the things I, I have met through the years, mm -hmm. and they still sent me for getting their clothes and not lose the deposits of 20% that right. they were a lot of money because those apartments were expensive in Bajaro. Mm -hmm. So still it happened that uh, the other day was my anniversary, my 60 year anniversary, okay. and one of those buyers was there. Okay, okay, so all right. <laughs> so you kept the relationship going, <laughs> yes, definitely. Relationship definitely. Right. So that's the thing that you have to re remain in peace, calm, and transfer that calm because if you get all nervous, right. it, it's not going to solve it. Exactly. What about you, Alicia? I learned to show up. To show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's that, difficult, huh? Yeah. To face that buyer in the face and right. tell them you know you have to keep your 20% down and keep moving your 40% or close on the unit yeah mm -hmm. so for me it was just showing up every day and remembering that each person was an individual mm -hmm. and that particular unit was the world to them mm -hmm. because when you're representing thousands of units which in fact we were mm -hmm. um, it's easy to lump everybody together mm -hmm. and just you know throw the same formula at everybody mm -hmm. and I learned that um, as as important as it was to come up with options mm -hmm. and potential solutions, it was just as important to listen to their story. Right. And oftentimes it was very painful because it was very similar stories, but it was a different voice on the other side. And and many people were very angry. Other people were very desperate. And, um, and you had to deal with this outpour of human emotion that was very, very tough. But I definitely learned that um, you needed to show up, you needed to listen, and, uh, uh, and as mom said, stay very calm and uh, focused on the fact that there were human beings on the right. other side, that it wasn't just numbers and contracts. Right. And I think that's a great, a great lesson for, for our listeners and our viewers. It's, I don't think I've, I've done any closing that goes 100% smooth. I mean, nothing happens, everything is fine and you know, everybody happy. Uh, it's usually something along the line, it's maybe the appraisal, maybe the bank. It's, there are so many factors involved in a closing. Uh, that sometimes we lose, you know, patience and uh, and and we start talking about ourselves. It's listening to our uh, to our clients sometimes is so so important more than the facts, more than the, than the truth. It's just listening to the to the uh, to the person and remember calm. And that's that's a great great lessons we we learn from from uh, both Alicia. So changing it now to a positive to a success success story. Can you share with us? A success story that uh, really made your business grow. One of many. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that um, I already spoke with you about my success story writing this letter to Harry Hempstead. Yes, that's a that great one. That's a, a great, great, great one. Yes. It was a very proactive. Yes, yes hear that. I, that was your first project, right? Yes, so, my first big project. Yes, hear that with us. That's an amazing story. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I read in the newspaper that Harry Hempstead, the most powerful man in, in real estate at that moment, had bought a piece of property in Brickell Avenue. What year was it? In 1978. Okay, in the 70s, okay. In the 70s, let's say 70s. And uh, I said, I thought that I have always had my heart 
uh, a brittle. Okay. My husband and myself have bought a piece of property uh, for $95,000 a brittle. At the time. Uh, at the time. Right. The same day that they passed the law, I went and bought a piece of property <laughs> before. Right. Before uh -huh. the, the owner was from Ohio and I was praying that he has not hear the news. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> to get the good price. You know? Okay. Okay. So, so I have already experienced in Brickell Avenue. So I wrote this, this, uh, this gentleman to, to his address in New York. The most uh, powerful man in real the estate. Power, owner of the Empire State Building, owner okay. of the Park Lane Hotel. Uh, he was in. If you went into a building in New York at that time, you can see his name, Henry Spear, Henry wow, Spear. Wow. Yes. He was, as I told you, he was a five times a billionaire when there were no billionaires. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. And I wrote him a letter and I explained to him who I was, that I have experience with South America, South Americans were looking at, at Miami for their vacation home. And to my surprise, two or three days, the secretary came and said, you have a call from New York, from Harry Hemsley. I thought that my partner was playing a prank on me. Okay. <laughs> was so so, you know? so okay. I went to the phone and a, a, a very uh, a professional voice of a secretary told me, Mrs. Cervera, yes, can you work, wait for Mrs. Harry Hemsley, please? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so he started there. Okay. I had a meeting with him. He hired me. The wife, which is, uh, was a very powerful woman, took me apart and said, you are going to have the job. You need the money, okay. <laughs> you are hard working as I can see, and, uh, and I think that you know your, your, your business. So he gave me the, he, they both gave me the, the job. So it was my first experience in, in success because of that job with the most important man in real estate opened me all the doors that I of wanted. Course. Yes. You see, sometimes we're afraid to ask, right? Mm, yes. And, uh, and many people in real estate are afraid to ask or intimidated by you know, a very powerful business person. Yes, yes. And uh, sometimes it's just asking what gets the job done. Yes. Most important that that job that we sold in two days, because it was amazing. We put another say, the man that owns the Inspired Building is building a palace in Miami. And that yeah. brought us people. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a, a production line. Mm -hmm. My other daughter is an industrial engineer. Mm -hmm. well, you enter from one door, there was the secretary give you the papers. There was the real estate agent that filled the paper for mm -hmm. you. There was the woman, the accountant that took your check. And then the factory, other this is the whole process. <laughs> the whole process. And wow. today we sold 200, we put under reservation 255 units. 255 <laughs> units in, in, yes. in how long? In, in two days. Wow. So all of a sudden I have in my account millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, I oh, call, yeah. so I call her and say, you know, I can go to Brazil now. <laughs> <laughs> I say, no, no, wow. I trust you, I trust you. Let me see where do I put my money. Wow. <laughs> because, <laughs> but to me, it, it, was, it was hilarious in a way, you know. And that opened so many doors for so you, I'm sure, doors, in the future, many, right? Of course, of course. It opened many. And besides those doors, I learned so much about him. What do you learn from him? For instance, uh, one day we had a problem with the city, mm -hmm. and they were taking our permits away. And I called him quite upset about it. I said... It's a little battle, but we're going to win the war, so don't worry. <laughs> keep, keep the calm, right? Yeah, keep, keep, the calm, calm, right? keep the calm. That's what I heard from him. Also. Okay. That's one of the things. The other time, he put his building more expensive than another building that was in it, just starting next door, and say, "Why are you? Are you going to pay?" Well, say, "Well, Alicia, let's figure it out." When these people started, the goal was at 300. Now the goal is at 450. Okay. So it's a great justification for us to have higher prices. Okay. Also because we're like all. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And he sold it for, for, the, for a higher price. For a higher prices. But much higher prices. Wow. As a matter of fact. So that was a great lesson and a great, a great men mentor. A without great mentor. That was my great mentor, yes. I... Any other lesson you learned from, from uh, Mr. Henry Heltman? Uh, Harry Henry. Yeah, well, I learned to, as you mentioned it very <laughs> adequately. No, adequately. Yeah. <laughs> At least if you I, can I, both I, correct us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I learned to be very calm right. about business right. and also to study all the angles okay. of the situation. So what do you well, mean by studying the angles? I study the angles. How do I put this uh, uh, building that mm -hmm. I am selling in the in a focus in the best way. Okay. Uh, so what we, did I do? I get the best advertising agency at that moment. Mm -hmm. I get 
a German that do the best signage for the outside. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I start working on all of those things that I think were a complement to his building. Okay. And the very high end of the, of the that was what it suit this project. Okay. And so those were little things that I added for the big picture. You know? Very interesting. Very interesting. Wow. What about you, Alicia? Uh, from no, I had such a leg up with mom. Okay, uh, and I know, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt you on that because I've talked to you before, but it's not only your admiration because she's your mother and a person, you know, if, if she's a good person, of course she's, but to you, we always look up to our, uh, you know, sure. father and mother, yeah. but the way you look up to her business-wise is just unbelievable, so. Um, well, I just feel so lucky right. that I've been right. able to work so close to her. Right. Um, so it was a tremendous head start. But I think for, for me, a, a defining moment in my career um, came when um, George Perez approached us mm -hmm. and said, we want to be partners with you. And that was when, what year? That was 13 years ago. 13 years ago. More or less. Mm -hmm. and, um, biggest developer in that town. The mm -hmm. biggest developer in town. But at the time, he was our client and not the biggest developer in town. Mm -hmm. he, um, in fact, we sold the first condominiums that George ever built. Which was? Uh, the um, Portofino Tower in South in Beach. In South Beach, definitely. Right. right. And he so, was doing affordable houses for that. Right. right, that was his niche. Yes, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And garden style apartments mm -hmm. and rent. Okay. So um, when George approached us and said he wanted to do that partnership, it was a bit of a conflict for Surveyor Real Estate because we represented many other developers and the company had a much longer history, mm -hmm. in fact, than, than even related mm -hmm. to it, certainly in that capacity. So. Um, we were faced with this uh, very prolific developer that was really taking off and doing very interesting mm -hmm. things. Uh, and the question was, what do we do? And I remember mm -hmm. that I was managing that situation. account. Yeah. So the burden was on me to figure it uh -huh. out. So I went to talk to um, a, a friend of mine that, um, after mom, has been very much a business mentor, mentor okay. of mine, I'm a man by the name of Freddie Behrens. Okay. And I said, Freddie, I've got this quandary. And I said, I don't know what to do. And, and he looked at me and he said, well, why don't you start another company? Okay. <laughs> and when he said it, it seemed so obvious. But it related, right? <laughs> and I said, wow, that makes sense. All right. And um, so we started the company okay. together. And uh, it, it, I remember when I came to mom with that idea, uh -huh. she said, listen, um, you do whatever you want to do, but don't think you're going to destroy my company oh. to start another company. <laughs> right. She okay. said, I said, well, absolutely not. Okay. You know? <laughs> of course not, mom. It's a big dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. She says, so, so I said, uh -huh. so she says, well, I'm going to make this very clear. Okay. Go ahead and do that. I think it's a good okay. plan. And by the way, our partnership went unchanged between okay. mom, Veronica, and I. Okay. And all the dollars dropped down to one basket and were divided the same way. Okay. So financially, there was never yeah. an issue. Okay. It was just how to do this. So she looked at me and said, you can take five people and that's it. Okay. <laughs> and I the mom are tough. You know. <laughs> yeah. you know, so okay. the first thing is, well, who are the five people? Right? Oh, you get to pick the five people. Well, with some editor. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. Yeah, it wasn't okay. quite a free uh -huh. hand. But uh -huh. I got some very good choices. Okay. And so um, we picked those five people. We started the new company. And it was tr tremendous run because obviously... Um, we did some amazing things with George mm -hmm. and we sold uh, thousands of apartments yep. and billions of dollars and it was a great journey in which um, Related became what it is today mm -hmm. and um, we sold, as I said, so much inventory and for me it was an opportunity to grow astronomically because uh, mom was very busy running Cervera Real Estate mm -hmm. and selling thousands of apartments right. and with, with Veronica and I was... Uh, on running this other company, which I had never run a company pretty much on my on my own right. because while I certainly had mom there backing me up and supporting me, she had her own company that right. was running and, and George was a little busy running related. Right. <laughs> so, so you were in the middle by so, your own. <laughs> so I was running this marketing organization and it was a it was a huge lesson in so okay. many ways. You said very a, a key word that struck me, it's marketing organization. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, as we all know, you can't sell anything that you don't market first. Right. So it really is a sales and marketing organization. Right. You have to um, identify what the product right. is uh, and then communicate that message. That, and I completely agree with you. I, uh, I said to the agents that we coach and that when they see our, they see our seminars is that we're not in the business of real estate, actually. We're in the business of marketing. Right. And, and, and real estate is the, is the vehicle. Uh, we need to learn, you know, to become very, very good marketers at what we do. If not, uh, even if we have the best product, 
sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, to sell it without yeah. a, without a doubt. Right. Yeah. And what do you learn specifically from that success, great success story, working with uh, George Perez and one of the biggest developers? And you know, um, I think I learned not to be afraid. That mm -hmm. with uh, every challenge came an opportunity. Okay. And there were never opportunities without challenges. Okay. And um, I, I also learned that time never is... Never opportunities without challenges. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And then... <clears throat> and um, I learned that time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. And that when you're working, uh, you're only as good as the job you do. Right. And it sounds harsh. Okay. But in our business, it's a harsh world. Yeah. And the more successful you are, the harsher it gets. <laughs> so yeah. when, okay. I, when my mom's, um, when I started in this business, okay. and I you know, would go to her often as I started, okay. I remember she looked at me one day and she said, listen, nothing is worth wrinkles. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and I, okay, okay, now, okay, good, good point, good point. So if you can't do it with a smile on your face, okay. and okay. if you're going to lose your feminine side, okay. and, uh, and the happiness, okay. then stop doing it. Right. And it was a it was a great lesson. So uh, with with success, uh, right. as I said, comes a lot of challenges. It's a hard job what we do, right. and the more successful you are, the more challenging it becomes. Right. Because as I said, with every opportunity right. comes challenges. So it was a very exciting time. We learned a lot. I also learned. I, I think I said not to be afraid, mm -hmm. and people often ask, why do you all lead them the market? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because we make it up as we right. go along. Yeah. Because to stay in front of things, you have to be very creative. Right. So you have to come up with new platforms to differentiate right. what you're doing from your competitors, and that's not only differentiating your product, right. but also your methodology. Right. So we're constantly reinventing yeah. how we do things. Mm -hmm. and, so the, you know, and you have to be willing to fail when you create things. What is something that you have reinvented right now while you're, you're trying new right now that it's working for, for you guys in the company? Uh, I think that, that for Alicia, one of his great reinventions mm -hmm. was when uh, she opened the sales of the Brickle House. Mm -hmm. It was the first building after the, the, the fall. The fall, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was a big building. And uh, I remember the developer coming to see me and uh, and immediately I called Alicia because she had also had a relationship with him in another project and uh, she gave him the idea that said, if you want to be successful in this market that is coming up you mm -hmm. have to do this type of building okay and she explained to him step by step the building that he was going that he should do for the moment to the developer the right and the building and was listened. so successful that when we opened the cell center we were already in 80 percent sold yeah 80 percent mm -hmm. sold with 70 percent now 70 percent down of uh, course because of the, the downturn uh, the, the, the in the market first one wow. the, 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 the banks they want to lend a penny if you were not completely protected so we got she got 70 percent down and, uh, and uh, it's closing next month next month yeah it's closing wow, and, and, and right. everybody has almost my granddaughter bought an apartment there and okay. she told me the other day that we have a lunch you know I put 70% and then I start giving money, now I have 100%. So when I close, I don't have to put the <laughs> That's money. That's it, there you go. I have to and worry about the maintenance and the taxes. Yes. So oh. that was a, a good experience to revive the market. Okay. Because when other people and other developers saw that this developer was sold out mm -hmm. for opening his end, right. they start looking and they start putting their feet on the, the right. market. So in that way, I think it was a great accomplishment of Alicia, those ideas. And uh, I... Uh, when uh, Alan O'Hare approached me to sell his building mm -hmm. uh, on on 10th Street, mm -hmm. I, just, I was thinking and said, you know, Brickle is such an, an English name and nothing English has been developed here in Santa Maria or oh. Palace or I don't know what. <laughs> okay, right. So I said, why we don't do the Bond, like Bond Street? Yeah, Bond Street in, 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 uh, like James in Bond, London, like yeah, yeah. That is exactly, right. And, uh, Very and, famous street and, in yes, London, yeah. And my sales manager there, uh, Polly, Polly uh -huh. he, he he took the she, idea with with, 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 a, lot of with a lot of passion. <laughs> so the, one of the things that we did is we called in London and we asked for a, a telephone booth. All right, which, <laughs> yes. which I see outside. Yeah. Yes, so they, definitely. They did uh, redo it. Okay. And they sent it to us. I don't okay. know how much cost. I say the price is not important. That's, this the is, thing that's is the marketing it. idea. Uh -huh. And you don't know how I have sold apartments to so many English dignitaries already. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
somebody from New York, somebody from this, and I have the visits of many important English people, like mm -hmm. uh, Beckman was here. Oh, really? Yes, I have wow, a lot of him. Oh. I was okay. with the, the grandson mm -hmm. of the, of the um, Queen of uh, England. Oh my God, yeah, The son Very of uh, Anne, the Prince Anne. Right. Very mm -hmm. handsome. He looks a lot like his cousin, okay. the future king. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it was something that it took us uh, up in sales and uh -huh. in everything. That's the idea of being, being uh, uh, the English. Uh, English Glamour. Spell. Right? <laughs> well, something. it's innovation, right? Yeah. It's yeah. innovation. Yeah. Yes. One, of, one of the things that I'm proudest of in mm -hmm. the cycle that I, I think um, is really redefined the way we're looking at the Bay. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I think our company has led often in um, creating new neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We did that on Brickell very early on with mom mm -hmm. when she took a, a, a horizontal neighborhood vertically. Mm -hmm. We did it uh, south of Fifth. Right. And uh, we were, in fact, the first to brand that neighborhood as south of Fifth mm -hmm. with an ad agency with mm -hmm. Len Dugo who came up with that. Okay. And it took this area that was known I as kind of, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, Len branded that. And when we rolled that out, mm -hmm. when we were selling south of Fifth, because nobody knew what to call it, it was a, you know, the dog thing the ice uh, factory remember was right. kind of a very, mm -hmm. a very ghetto area mm -hmm. and uh Which and, is not anymore. <laughs> and now it's the most expensive <laughs> exactly. per square foot real estate exactly. in the city yeah. and now we're doing that yeah. um in east edgewater okay in this area that's being defined by the venetian causeway to the south the exactly. uh, julia Tubble to the north biscayne boulevard mm -hmm. to the west and biscayne bay to the east okay. so this is east edgewater but the really spectacular thing that i'm very proud of okay. is that um, we've invited people to dive into the bay again. Okay. When I grew up in Miami, we used to swim in the bay all the time. Right. There was a beach in Coral Gables mm -hmm. on the bay, the entrance to Key Biscayne, we'd go swimming mm -hmm. there. Right. And then all of a sudden, as these high rises started coming up, we put up seawalls, and people were asked to look at the bay, but not swim yeah. in the bay. And if you look around the expensive homes, you'll see people on paddle boards. Mm -hmm. In fact, I learned how to water ski in the bay. Okay. People go to Monument Island and some right. of them, but there hadn't been a development that said, engage the bay mm -hmm. and in Biscayne Beach we created the the pool deck mm -hmm. and we made it a beach with mm -hmm. sand and with everything and then there's a walkway and we have three swimming platforms and instead of calling them docks we said these are swimming piers okay. and we created storage for paddle boards and we invited people to go into the bay, the bay right shortly after we did uh -huh. that our next competitor okay. all of a sudden redesigned their project so and innovation. came out with the beach club <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. and i was so complimented i said my gosh it's i think we've done it yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. and it's actually a wonderful thing for the city because right. who wants to drive all the way to miami beach right. and quite frankly if you're paddle boarding it's much right. better in the bay right so uh, i think it's transformational for the okay. city and I think that it, it's helped us uh, get much higher values okay. on the Bay side. And it, it's just opened up a plethora of opportunities for us. Now, uh, that was one of our questions because I have the privilege to have the, both Alicia's here today. That don't, doesn't happen very often. So I want to take my time more than 35 minutes. Uh, I wanted to talk about the market, about agents. So since we're talking about the market, how do you see uh, the real estate market in South Florida, both of you, uh, in the future? You know, yesterday I was in a, an on opening of the of the real estate office, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, people that I think that uh, does a very good job in selling Miami was there, and he says that it's crazy to think of bubble in Miami. Bubble in Miami. Mm -hmm. It's crazy to think about right. it when he realized that our prices toward the prices of all around the world. Mm -hmm. They say that our prices are still so low, and the interest of so many people in the whole world True. so gear to come to Miami mm -hmm. that we have just seen the beginning of a great thing. Exactly. Not, not the middle of the end, but mm -hmm. the, like Winston Churchill used to say, you know, it's when they told him about the war and he has won something, he said, he told the people, this is the, this is, is, is this is not the end. Mm -hmm. It's not even the beginning of the end, <laughs> okay. but it's the end of the beginning. Okay. There you go. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, and yeah. I think that in this stage we are at the end of the beginning. At the be oh, exactly. Of that. Bro, yes. I think my my saying it, Miami has been discovered. Yeah. Uh, before people used to come here and you know for a beach apartment mm -hmm. for the for you know for the South Americans so or for uh, up north New Yorkers would come here to retire, but uh, now it's within the 10 most important cities for wealthy people. Yeah. It's, it's very, extremely important. I want your take on, on Miami in the future, in the next five years, and how do you see all these buildings 
being developed and uh, what do you think is going to happen with the market? Uh, I think that the, the market and the city is going to continue to grow. Yeah. I mean, uh, it sounds yeah. silly when I say it and people look at me twice, and, but right now we actually have a shortage mm -hmm. of inventory for people that are ready to move in. Mm -hmm. The upward pressure on rentals is huge, mm -hmm. and if we don't start delivering inventory, um, I don't know where the people that are coming to Miami are going to live. Mm -hmm. We've made so many super significant strides of which we're going to be feeling the impact more and more in the next five to ten years, um, the least of which is certainly not education, which mm -hmm. we've done an amazing job with our superintendent sure. being um, voted mm -hmm. the top superintendent in the country last mm -hmm. year, invited to the White House, University of Miami breaking through the top 50, the Asian enrollment in the university, Definitely. which went from de minimis right. to thousands of students. Mm -hmm. um, I often say that when children are little, uh, they follow their parents. When mm -hmm. children grow up, the parents follow them. <laughs> okay. So this is a very young city. <laughs> and um, and the parents are going to be following all of these people. And of course, we know the tremendous wealth out of the Far East and the Middle East Definitely. for that matter. So we're seeing the beginning of, of that with uh, the investment of Swire over a, million, a billion dollars, right. the investment of the Malaysian group, the Genting group, mm -hmm. um, and the Herald Miami. site. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, the I think the, the Miami World Center, but yes. that's not Asian money. But we're seeing major capital being uh, invested in Miami and billion dollar projects. It, where very few cities, certainly in the United States, have right. the opportunity for billion dollar projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Miami World Center case, it's actually American money, mm -hmm. which is also very important as well. Because I, I, I tease my American friends and say, mm -hmm. listen, guys, the new flight capital is really American. It's coming from New York and California. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, yeah. So. I, I think that we have tremendous opportunities moving forward mm -hmm. and that we're still such a young city mm -hmm. and Miami has now become a world-class uh, brand mm -hmm. because when you're talking about world-class cities, that we are on that platform and we're on we that are. platform in a beautiful way because we are a city where people want to come spend their money mm -hmm. and we have to catch up with where people make their money. Mm -hmm. But we're doing a lot in that capacity as well. Mm -hmm. And we're in a very fortunate situation where we're importing intellectual capital, mm -hmm. not only from, um, from around the world, but also from major universities in the country because our employment is very solid. Mm -hmm. So the city, uh, I was on a panel the other day mm -hmm. and they had a, a live questionnaire going and it says, what do you think is responsible for Miami's growth? Is it the geography, the weather, or the people? And uh, everybody said the, the location. Yeah. And then they went to me and they said, well, Lisa, you're a realtor, right? Okay. So you're gonna say, okay. I said, listen, I'm going to take a contrarian point of view. Okay. We've always had the location. We've always had the weather. And there's lots of other places that can claim both. It's the people yeah. that make Miami such a special place. Because we yeah. are, have been for 30, 40, 50 years importing talent and attracting talent, and that is snowballing. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting that much talent coming to a place, there's nothing but upside. So it's the location and the weather other cities have, but the people, only Miami has. The people, right? the location, and the weather. Right, right. <laughs> and such a young right. place. Right. You can come here and do almost anything, right. because so much needs to get done. Right. And the stuff that's getting done is underserved. Right. right. Also the growing of the, the museums, though. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The culture. The the culture. Now we have this infrastructure now too. E Emerge Miami and what's that doing to bring technology, which is so important for jobs. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Art Basel of technology right. as it's being dubbed. Um, our, again, our universities continue to grow. Um, our public school systems mm -hmm. are actually becoming a viable option and top mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And that the work that's being done there is, is continuing exponentially. The arch right. the, the, well, we have over a billion dollars of infrastructure between the Adrian Arts Center, the um, American Airline Arena, the uh, Perez Art Museum, and the Patricia and Phil Frost Science mm -hmm. Museum. Right, right there. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and it's all new, mm -hmm. so it's all state of the art. And, and more to come. And every day our connectivity increases. We're still waiting for the Panama Canal to be finished. Right. But our infrastructure is ready. Right. We've done the dredging. We've got the cargo lifts. We're building the, the, uh, the, the, the train. We're well, expanding. We, the tunnel the, uh, is done. Right. And, the, and talk about a great thing. That train, which is for right. the first time going to make Miami truly a, a, a tri-county opportunity. Because right. you can get on that train. You can go to Fort Lauderdale, to Palm Beach, and all the way right. to Orlando. And forget going to Orlando. Right. Can you imagine all the people that go to Orlando that are going to come here? Conventions and all those things. The definitely. convention center, right. which is also um, now coming to Miami, mm -hmm. 1800 room yeah. convention center. 
and hotel. Right. So very important uh, infrastructure that, that continues. Make it even better as a South American born. I will tell you, if we have the soccer here. Oh, imagine. Imagine if we have that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's coming, that it's has coming. to come in one place or the yes. other. And now, going back <coughs> now to, to the agents, to most of the people that are uh, looking at, at the video or, or watching, this, uh, listening to this interview, you guys have, you, you have more than 300 agents here and uh, you've worked with so many in the past and of course in the present. Uh, what makes, what characteristics make a good agent, a great agent? Yeah. Sure, uh, I, th I think that it's a combination of discipline and entrepreneurship. Discipline and entrepreneurship. Yes. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So, but let's do. Okay. So, the, okay. Continue. But I, I like the word entrepreneurship because uh, I say this is not a job. This is not a career. This is a business. Yes. Right. So. Right. So um, I think that uh, people are attracted to to real estate oftentimes because of the freedom that it affords you. Mm -hmm. And freedom is a beautiful thing, but only if you don't abuse it. Right. So but only if you don't abuse it. Yes. Exactly. So in this business, you have to have the discipline to show up. We mm -hmm. talked about showing up. Right, right. You have to show up every day. And one of the challenges is that, um, especially at the beginning, mm -hmm. is that people think they don't have anything to do. So why am I going to go to work? I don't have anything to do. I don't have an appointment. I don't have a showing. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have anything. Okay. And I always tell the, the agents when they're starting, I said, listen, if you think you're going to make more money sitting at home than being in the office, right. go get another job. Right. Because that's just not going to happen. If you're in the office, at least there's a possibility of an opportunity. Right. So at a minimum, do that. But then the entrepreneurship kicks in because entrepreneurs are creative and they just do things. And this is like any business, I think. You, if, if you're being creative, you can't be afraid of trying whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do the things that seem obvious, but also do the things that don't seem obvious. Um, so go to lunch with a different person. Pick up the phone and call somebody. Go through your Rolodex and figure out who's a good source, who isn't a good source, and call all of them. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows somebody, and you never know when there's going to be a breakthrough. And if you really can't think of anything else to do, then start going for, to showings. Mm -hmm. Pick up a phone, call an agent, and make an appointment to go see property. So at least you get educated in what's out there, and you start making contacts with the other agents. My mom told me when I got into this business, if you want to be successful, you have to be the first one in and the last one out. Good point. And Very good I point. added to that with my yeah. daughter, if it's not illegal or immoral, do it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, very good. All right. <laughs> See? So, okay, talking about motivation and talking about hard work. Hard work. Okay, if it is not illegal or immoral, <laughs> do it. All right. <laughs> I like that's that's a drive kicking in. <laughs> yeah. Very good. It's better than not doing. Uh, well, that's well, for sure. Definitely, definitely. I'm gonna take that one because it's very, very interesting. So, what would you yes. suggest? Well, I always tell my people that there are different ways of of getting involved with the business. One well, thing is very simple. I say just open a magazine, see all the real estates that are advertising there, mm -hmm. call them and say, I just started in my business, I have read your article, I, I think that the properties are beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you start talking about it, and then all of a sudden one of them will tell you uh, more for the, the prices have been down, it's a great opportunity mm -hmm. or something, and, and you look at that. So it's uh, it's. Uh, it's never, it's, it's one of the good things about this profession that is the less boring profession in the world. Exactly. You have something <laughs> different to do every single every day, right? Day. Yeah. One of your questions, I think it's uh, what is uh, your everyday life, what is mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I was going to respond to that. <laughs> yeah. But that, that thing that every day brings surprises exactly. <laughs> in yes. our business. Definitely. Every day, every day brings a lot of surprises and a lot of, of uh, different routes to, to mm -hmm. follow. Now, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about discipline, uh, we talk about every single day brings surprises. One daily practice uh, that makes both of you very successful. Yeah, I know there are many, but one in particular. I would like Alicia to respond her because I don't want her to imitate me. One daily practice. One daily practice. It's going to be repetitive, but I show up every day. Show up. Yeah. I'm here every day. Um, I'm here when I'm not here. Okay. And um, so in the old days, I my practice was to finish every day. Right. You know, anything that was 
on my to-do list was finished. That was in the old days? It was in the old days okay. because in the new days, it's you never finish because your okay. email comes at one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning, you never finish. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to not finish. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a journey. To accept it and to... And by the way, yeah. one of the, the difficult things that I had to do in order to grow personally in my business was to stop doing things that I liked doing because it wasn't the best and highest use of my time. Okay. So I had to give up a lot of things that I really enjoyed right. in order to take my business to the next level. Okay. So, um, so what you do is going to change. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you are doing every day is not. Okay. You need to do. And at some point you need to put the immediate and the urgent aside to deal with the important right. stuff. So um, you have to ignore the phone and you have to ignore that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the day-to-day -day business right. in order to sit back and, and put together a strategic plan right. that will really help you move forward. Right. So at times when I thought that um, my business was perhaps not going in the direction mm -hmm. it should be, uh, I remembered a story with um, Bill Gates mm -hmm. when he, he apparently as a child would go and sit in his attic mm -hmm. for hours. And this was many, many years ago um, when he was first starting and people didn't really know who Bill Gates I mean, I guess they knew because okay. his mother was being interviewed. And his mother said that she would go nuts because her kid was sitting oh, in the attic right. with the lights off. Okay. And one day she finally couldn't take it anymore and went up there and said, Bill, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Mom, don't you ever think? <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> and at yeah. that point, I was in a transition in right. my career. And I decided that I was going to take half an hour a day right. and just think. Right. I have to tell you, it's very difficult to turn off all the noise yeah. and just think. Right. Um, that year, I made more money than I ever had yeah. up until that right. point in my okay. career. Right. That's something we, uh, we say in coaching to the agents that, that we coach. It's three things, right? Every single day. And if you can do first, first thing in the morning, every day, plan, plan your business. 12 to 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be more than that. 12. If you do it every single day, you'll have a very clear uh, mind of wh where you're headed, where, you're, wh where you want to go. Practice. Practice your presentation. Practice your whatever your, 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 your skills have to, uh, to be. And learn something new every single day. Practice learning. And planning every single day. So. Did I do it this uh, every night? Because I, I, when I go to bed, I have a pencil because I like to. I love to write in pencils. Okay. I don't okay. Know why? Well, well there's something magical pencil. that happens in the brain when you when you write it instead of just putting it into a phone. And, and every mm -hmm. night, night I write the most important things that the company needs. Every like, single night. Every. Every single well, night. Not well, every single, mo but, most of but most, most of the nights. Right. Most uh -huh. of the nights. Almost every. Okay. I write down. Uh, Four or five of the most important things. Mm -hmm. next, That's planning. Next day, my my assistant, mm -hmm. which is also the C whatever C O Chief C Operator. Okay. Chief Operator. Okay. And I said it years ago when he started, she was my assistant. Mm -hmm. Now she has been become, but still she remains my assistant okay. because I communicate very well with her. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, I call, she calls me and I review the things. Every morning at eight thirty, she calls me. Every morning at 8.30 she yeah, reviews whatever morning. you wrote the yes. night before. Yes. What and a great uh, we, habit. And, we, and I tell her, this is missing, this is missing, this is missing, and, and we do those things. And that happens almost every day in the week. Planning. Yes. Planning. And if I don't do, I cannot even sleep well because then these things are going to be jumping in my head, you know? <laughs> Once right, I put right, it in paper, right, right. then they don't jump in my head anymore. Right. They are already wrote down. Very, very, very good point. Now, the next point, I think that both of you agree on planning, which is, is huge for the business. If we only concentrate on the uh, emergencies, it's, we never get anything. All, everything is usually an emergency. Yes. So now let's go back to, to the agents. Uh, if you could give, give a piece of advice to a brand new agent, an agent that's been, just got his, his or her license, been in the business for less than six months, what would it be? Yeah, I, would, I, would, I don't know. I don't know if I discuss it with you, mm -hmm. but I think that the best thing that you can give an agent is to concentrate in an area that they like. That yes, you did before the interview. Yes, yes. Positioning, yes. Yes, positioning uh -huh. yourself in a territory. Right. This is going to work. And when you position yourself and you know which is going to be your territory, no better than anybody else mm -hmm. about the prices, the, the, the availability of things that are there, the possibilities and everything. And then you will be successful. Mm -hmm. and I, every time that somebody in my office has followed that advice, 
they have come at the end of the year and say, I have you to say, for thank you for the advice. We have concentrated on that. Alicia, I can agree more than, uh, uh, with you. It's That's the, our first step in coaching. It's position yourself in terms of the area where you're going to work, the type of client you're going to work, and the type of property you're going to be working. So position it's extremely, extremely important. Extremely important. Yeah. What about you, Alicia? I would say once you do that, mm -hmm. then find the leader in that market mm -hmm. and go work for them for free. There you go. And there. I say for free okay. because it doesn't matter what you pay, get paid or don't get right. paid. Um, I, yeah. I firmly believe that you get what you give, mm -hmm. and if you make yourself available to mm -hmm. that person, right. um, you will you will wind up getting much more than you give. Okay. So um, find a mentor. Right. Find a mentor, definitely. And it's I, much easier to ask who than to ask yourself how, right? Right. right. Yes, because right. if you're with the right who, right. you'll find exactly. out why. I, I often say that if you can ask the right question, mm -hmm. you'll always come up with the answer. Right. It's harder to ask the right questions, right. and that's why mentoring works right. so well. So, and I also tell new agents and, and older agents mm -hmm. all the time, remember that part of something is so much better than all of nothing. There, there you go, exactly. And I think oftentimes um, right. in, in business, people get stuck with not wanting to share and not wanting right. to to divide and conquer. And it's an enormous mistake. Right. Right. Um, I believe that uh, you, you spread it around, it comes back right. many, many times. Right. You mentioned something that we stress very, very much in, uh, in coaching, which is questions. Uh, the quality of our business is determined by the quality of the conversations we have with our clients, right? Yes. But the quality of those conversations are determined by the quality of the questions we ask and every time I'm doing an interview like this I'm not nervous about how I look in camera or if we're going to take half an hour 40 minutes is am I asking the right questions interesting questions not only to keep the audience interested but to keep you interested uh, so questions are so 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 important especially when you're working with buyers and sellers definitely definitely yes, that's right that's true. just say something about the the top producers. Yes. <laughs> no? uh -huh. Yes. Uh, what advice would you give to a top producer? Yes. <laughs> I remember. I, I always tell people that they have to learn to get out of the box. Mm -hmm. I don't say that to the beginners because they probably don't know even what is in the box. <laughs> They're not even in the box. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. for the ones that have already said, I say, uh -huh. many, we people, we are limited by our, our own field of view. Right. And we don't understand that the world has more limits than the one that we put to uh -huh. ourselves. Uh -huh. The limits are incredible. You uh -huh. just have to go there and take those limits. Exactly. And so I tell them, please don't get only the square. Get mm -hmm. out of that square exactly. and you will be more successful and you will be accomplishing more. Uh -huh. And I think that, uh, that that helps. Yeah. That helps to see these things in different points of view, not only anything uh -huh. that you are looking at. Uh -huh. And being humble, right? Sometimes we make a little bit of money, more money than we ever made before, and then we think we know it all. Yeah. And uh, I think that happens. Yes. To in in real estate, that? that happens a lot uh, mm -hmm. to uh, young agents that are making lots of money at yes. age of 26, 27. Yes. And then we think that, that well, we th I'm not 27 anymore. <laughs> they think. Yes. It happened to me when I was 27 years I, old. I, and, uh, I was telling my son the other day that in relation to money, you should live here. Uh -huh. Be prepared to live here. Okay. So you will don't you you will never go under. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Yes. There you Live go. Live here, but keep this here, <laughs> so you can never go under. <laughs> never go under. Exactly. What <laughs> advice would you give to an experience? I mean, you have many top producers in the company. So, yeah. so what mom, what advice do you give to them? Mom talked about thinking outside of the box, right? And I think that uh, that's critical, and no one does that better than mom does. Mm -hmm. She always surprises me about right. that. I think that's one of the reasons that makes her so always been mm -hmm. an industry leader. But it's not only about thinking outside of the box, but getting outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're comfortable doing what you're doing, that's a huge red flag that you right. need to be doing more. Right. Uh, so as soon as you get comfortable, right. figure out how you can make yourself uncomfortable because that's where you grow. Right. Um, oftentimes that means um, believing in yourself enough to know mm -hmm. that you can afford an assistant. Right. Or you can afford a marketing budget, right. or you can afford a vacation. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right. So, um, or that you should try a different model. Right. And also, don't ever assume that what you're doing now that has created your success mm -hmm. is going to create your success 
in the next season, right. in the next cycle, in the next year. Right. So um, you have to be reinventing yourself and constantly looking right. for new business opportunities. Right. Right. So yeah. when you're in this cycle, think about what's coming next and how am I going to be successful in that next time. Right. Right. Well, thank you very much for, for that. And uh, one more question that I want to ask, because uh, I usually finish with this, but uh, you know, thinking outside the box and, and, and making sure that you stretch yourself and, and make yourself uncomfortable is definitely part of growing, right? If not, we're not, we're not advancing. Now, I ask you for permission. <laughs> I don't know if you remember what I asked you for. Because uh, when, when your daughter told me about two weeks ago when I met her, uh, well, she, I didn't ask her, she told me. Uh, and I'd say this with the most respect and admiration, all right? How old you were, all right? And I, again, I asked you for permission, uh, and you said, I don't mind. And uh, how old are you? 84 and a half. 84. <laughs> and you see the faces of the camera people when we talk about that. Yes, uh, I'm 39, and look at me. I look like 55. I had a client the other day saying, Orlando, you're super young. You must be like 44. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. so how do you keep it so fresh, uh, so fresh uh, energy at that time, uh, at, you know, uh, for so, so many years? It's... Uh, and, and working hard 24-7 for, you know, with so many people in the company. What's the secret? I think that uh, the secret is that I do something that I like very much. Okay. I have passion for what I do. Okay. And I always say, I feel very sorry when I see somebody that is doing something that I don't like. Okay. Even real estate, I have some few times tell people, this is not your you sing, just right. do it other right. thing. Put gas in a gasoline station. Okay, okay. all right, whatever you like to do. Like. All right. Yes. And I, I think that that has, what when things you go in is when you have passion for something. Okay. Because uh, every day you find interest. Mm -hmm. And when you lose interest, you become old. Right. So you okay. have to, to keep your interest high. Now, I said that was the last question, but I want to take one more. I know <laughs> you have to go because you're always busy. I no. know that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been in the business for 15 years in Miami. I know many agents from Cervera Real Estate. Uh, the admiration they have for both of you, other than the business side, uh, it's, it's impressive and I congratulate you on that. Uh, why do uh, you think they have that admiration and that respect but not that boss, and, you know, employee respect, it's just personal admiration for the person, for the person more than the business person. I think that Cervera is a family company. Okay. So everybody that enters to Cervera becomes like a member of the family. Okay. And uh, and the people that uh, that you have talked to them probably they have uh, they have some relationship with us that is more profound than only a working relationship. Mm -hmm. I think it's a family. What? Well, why do I say family? If they have a problem. We talk to them, okay. we listen to them, we get interested in their pro in the private things. Mm -hmm. If they want us to be interested, of course, we don't interfere. Mm -hmm. Not, and I think that that in many of the agents that I am thinking that you could have talked to them, sometimes I have crossed the path of their of their own internal life mm -hmm. because they have invited me and I have been helpful in one way or the other. At least I have been there, you know. <laughs> At least you want to add anything to that. I think it starts with that for sure. Mm -hmm. That um, that it is a family business. It's a it's a woman's business, mm -hmm. and uh, and we think that uh, people first. Mm -hmm. If the people aren't feeling right, the the business is never going to be right. Um, but I also think that it's a principle centered company, mm -hmm. and uh, while it is a business, um, we we respect uh, everyone involved in that business, and mm -hmm. I think we've protected our our agents and our and our staff in good times and in bad times. Um, in the last crisis, one of the big drivers for me um, in coming back to Cervera was to protect the people that had taken mm -hmm. such good care of us mm -hmm. in the good times and really making a, a full-blown effort. And in fact, we made the decision to double the size of our company when some, most companies were shrinking and firing people. Mm -hmm. And the goal was really to not become part of the problem by firing people, but to survive the crisis and come out the other side sooner mm -hmm. by taking care of those people. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, that proved to be a beautiful thing because mm -hmm. then the market turned around and right. we were ready. So um, I think that, that uh, people appreciate when you care about them. Right. Um, they appreciate that when they're with you working and they appreciate that when they move mm -hmm. on. So um, I think that mom set that standard mm -hmm. early on when she created the company. 
and uh, we hope to perpetuate that. I, I not only know that you mean it, uh, but you show it with your agents. I know many of them have been with the company for many, many, many years. So yeah. I can thank you enough for having the, this opportunity to interview both of you at the same time. Uh, again, thank you very much for having me in your beautiful new offices <laughs> in Brickell Avenue. Yeah. And uh, thank you for coming to an edition of Top Producer Miami. Thank, thank you for you. your interest and the opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll see you in another edition. Have a great day.